You are listening to episode number 18 of the Happy Choir Podcast. <laughs> Hola, people. I am your host, Carlos Cordero, creator of the Happy Choir Podcast, helping you connect with others through choral music. No matter if you're a singer, a composer, or a conductor of choral music, this is your place to connect with others and to learn more about other people. Robbie Lavanca is our guest today, and it was such a great, it's been challenging to schedule all of these interviews, but also so rewarding to hear from people who are doing the things out there. Robbie is a professional singer and a composer. He lives here in Austin, Texas, where he co-founded Inversion Ensemble, an organization dedicated only to new choral music. How awesome, right? And in this episode, he shares with us the journey to construct this machine that just keeps growing. As you will hear in this episode, they started with a mixed choir, and now, three years after, they have two mixed choirs, and a female voices choir, and they are all really awesome. So I'm excited for you to hear from Robbie the challenges that they went through to put the first concert, but also how his career as a singer and as a composer helped him on the way. He also gives great advices on how to avoid burnout during this process. I am so thankful that you're here with us in the Happy Choir podcast. Let's listen from Robbie now. <laughs> And in today's episode, we have with us Robbie Labanca. He is, uh, well, have you heard me say, a wonderful singer who's also a composer. But the thing that I love the most and about this cruel world is that people just don't do one thing and they are excellent in several stuff. And I'm glad that Robbie can be with us today. Hello, Robbie. Hey, how's it going? Doing good, doing good. There is a little bit of allergies, you know, Cedar and Texas. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so I hope my voice is, you know, pleasant enough to our audience. We're very thankful that you're here. So thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. At this point, I've had already introduced you to our audience uh, in a previous description of what you do and what you do in the music scene here in Austin. But we would love to hear from you. And we can start from the beginning. How did you get into music? What were your first steps? Um, so, I mean, when I was a kid, I started taking piano lessons as a, you know, as a kid, like lots of kids do. And then I got into band when I was in junior high. And I lived in a small town in South Texas that didn't have a choral program. Um, we just had a band. And so I was in band in junior high. And then when I moved and went into high school, we moved into... Corpus Christi, which is, you know, a larger city, of course, in South Texas. And the, the school that I moved to had a choral program in the high school. So then I started doing choir and band. Um, I sort of realized partway through high school that I really enjoyed doing choir more, more than band. Um, this, it was, it was newer to me and I did it all, you know, I did that. I had a private voice teacher and then I decided kind of late in my high school life that I wanted to go to college for music. Um, I hadn't, that really wasn't my path at all. <laughs> I wanted, originally I wanted to be a medical examiner for many years when I was growing up and wanted, that's what I thought I wanted to do for a career. So I wanted to like, you know, be the person who works in a coroner's office. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I was really interested in. And I kind of decided I kind of made the choice, like at the time I was filling out college applications that I wanted to go into music. So um, I did that. I went and got my undergrad degree at UT Austin. Um, and then I've just been singing and performing all over the place. Um, and I, I was writing stuff in college, but because I wasn't actually a composition major, you know, I wasn't my, the things I was writing weren't getting seen. You know, I was kind of just writing them on my own time. And they weren't really getting performed because, of course, I wasn't showing them to anybody. And it wasn't until Chorus Austin selected one of my pieces to do for Southwest Voices that I had ever actually had a piece of mine performed, you know, by a professional ensemble. I had written some things for a church choir that had been performed in some instrumental pieces and things like that. 
um, and some solo uh, vocal things. But, you know, that was really the first time that I, you know, a non church choir had performed any of my music. How wonderful. And it's so interesting to hear your story with this because I'm not stranger to also wanting to be first in med school. I actually started and did one year of med school before I changed to music. So I understand how, you know, we can sometimes, oh, this is interesting. I want to know more. Yeah. You know, once you get to choir, was there a favorite part that you had in choir that really drew you? Was it the singing or the repertoire? I had a really, I mean, part of it is because I had a really great teacher. Um, my, so when I changed schools in junior high, I, I changed schools like halfway through my eighth grade year, which of course, you know, is really difficult at that age. Um, and also like, you know, looking back, like not being aware of it at that time, but, you know, realizing now that I have obviously had issues like making friends and stuff because of, I had problems You know, I had insecurities about things, which, mm -hmm. you know, went through later on in life, but really realizing about my sexuality and all that kind of stuff. So when you're, you know, when you're eighth grade, it's difficult. And I, it's challenging. you know, I didn't know anyone halfway through my eighth grade year. So I had, I kind of just hung out in the band hall when I was like, you know, before or after school. And my teacher was really great and made me feel comfortable. And then when I moved, when I went to the high school the next year, that same teacher who taught band at the junior high taught choir was a choir teacher at the high school. And so he was, you know, asked me if I'd ever thought about joining choir and all that kind of stuff. And so um, that was part of it was just kind of like feeling comfortable being myself. And, and I think that's something that's a little bit different from choir than band is that like, it, it's such a personal thing. I mean, when, when your instrument is you, yeah, you know, everything is very personal. So when you kind of grow up in that, like your formative years in high school, kind of realizing those things about yourself and enjoying it and making music with other people, it's a little bit different um, than doing band. And that's not to say that being an instrumentalist isn't, you know, personal, but there's something uniquely personal about like, you know, the thing that you're making music with is part of you. It's a thing that resonates with you, right? So for you, it was... Uh, the choir and as you say not that being an instrumentalist is any different but it speaks different to other people and it's interesting to see that even though you started in band you could connect with the choir then thanks to a teacher yeah and I think I think also for me is that I've also loved like as a kid I, did, I read all the time I loved reading and I like in junior high and high school I really got into reading and writing poetry and I really love that as a medium and of course that's one thing that separates choral music from instrumental music is that we have text and so like finding a, a way through which we can express meaning beyond just the music itself through having text you know was something that was really uh, attractive to me about singing it was like a way to really dig down and analyze what you were singing the meaning behind things and that kind of stuff and I really I really love that. So that's another thing that was kind of personal to me that helped make those connections pretty strong between, you know, choral, choral music. How awesome to hear about that. Because, you know, at first in my story, for example, I didn't know, I, I knew I wanted to perform music, but it came later in my life that I knew, oh, I can be a composer too. Like, that's something that you can do. When you were in choir, you felt connected to the performance and to the text, as you say. Did you feel that you could be a composer too? Is that something, an option that you were, that were in the back of your mind by then? I mean, when I was, I think like whenever, ever since I was a kid and all the way through up through high school, like I used to kind of like write songs, you know, and things like that, like on my own. Um, I don't know that I ever consider that to be something that I could do um, kind of full time. And I think part of that is, I think part of that is just a little bit of our, academic kind of obsession with m music that's not modern. And I think that most kids, you know, even, even through college, quite frankly, so many people just aren't exposed to anything that's been written in the last, you know, 50 years, uh, you know, unless, unless it's like an octavo or something that's been written, that's like on the PML list for them to take to UIL. Like these are not, you know, typically people are singing, kind of standard rep 
which is fine. It has a lot to teach us, but it's hard to imagine yourself doing something when the only examples of that craft come from people who've been dead for 200 years. You know, it's like, it doesn't seem like a, a career that you can have. And so I think when I was in college, we had, we did have a class that was like an arrangement class, arranging class that was to like, how do you make arrangements for things for your choir? Cause I was a music education major. So it was kind of in the context of arranging things for your choir. And so that's when I really started to <clears throat> explore that aspect of things and realize that I could, that I could write things and that, you know, it could go beyond just arranging. But I don't think that was really something that I thought was a sustainable career. And even long, even long after college, it was like I was writing these things with kind of the understanding that I didn't think they would ever get performed um, just because I didn't have a, an avenue through which that happens. And, it, you know, as you are well aware, you know, it's difficult to get your music out there and get people to perform things when they don't know who you are. Yeah, and the, it's interesting for me also to hear about your story about the connection with literature and poetry, because I feel that you found these gems of poetry. You know, many people can just go to the most performed uh, authors and most performed poems, but I feel that something in your music as a composer is that you find the texts that are different from what we usually hear in in a concert and. I really enjoy that. So that can be, you know, a, a whole other episode on your text selection. But yeah, I just find interesting the connection that you do with that. Yeah, I try not to, I try not to set, you know, when I was, well, well I should preface this by saying when I first started, of course, you know, I was setting things that yeah, of course. a lot of people had set because it's, you know, what typically happens. But then like, as I kind of developed, it was, you know, if I'm going to make what I consider to be like interesting or innovative music, then I feel like the text can also be that as well, which includes, you know, we often forget as composers who are writing now that the struggle that we go through with our music and getting performed is not that far removed from what's happening with people in the literary arts as well. I mean, we have modern living poets who, you know, work is not being published and printed And so to me, if we can, you know, kind of make that connection between people who, you know, are writing now and setting that text, that that's a an avenue for th for them to have their work out there in the world. It's a, it's a teamwork. Yeah. Then it becomes something that you helped me, I helped you, but then we're creating this experience for the audience. And maybe even uh, many people that write uh, texts haven't think about this option, right? Yeah, I don't think that poets necessarily you know, are thinking about whether or not their text is ever going to get set to music, which is kind of a fun experience. I mean, I've, when I've spoken to poets and stuff and asked them about setting music, like sometimes I'm the first person who's ever approached them um, about setting things to music, which is really exciting because then it's, I think that opens a whole other door for them possibly about, you know, having people, more people exposed to their, to their writing. I mean, I, I know of like, probably three or four examples of poets that I've set who are living poets that I've reached out to. And they've been like, Oh, like no one's ever asked me to set this set text of mine before. And it really surprises me. But like we said, I would say, you know, the majority of people working in choral composition, or even vocal composition are, you know, for, for lots of logistic reasons, looking for things that are in public domain. Because of course it's easier when it comes to getting rights and that kind of stuff. But yeah. You know, if you're able to make a one-on-one -on -one connection with a poet, you know, th those hurdles are easier to overcome because you're making a connection with them directly and then they can sort out getting rights and things for you to do that. Oftentimes, especially if they're not, especially if they're not even published, then they're just giving you personal permission to, you know, to use their work. Yeah, exactly. It's not impossible. Yeah. And then in listening to also to your story and the way that you go through your high school to college and you start to... Uh, consider this career in music and as a performer do you feel that the motivation came from within within you or do you feel that somebody a mentor or people outside were your main motivation to keep going i mean i think it's kind of a combination it, it was tough for me honestly you know in in undergrad because you know i did not grow up in a family that had you know large financial resources i'm the youngest of four kids and You know, by the time I was graduating high school and going to college, like my three sisters ahead of me had, you know, were already adults and 
you know, out in the world and, and everything like that. And I, you know, I was able to go to college because I was on, on scholarships. I was there from, for music education, like I said before, but I, I did have teachers and other people tell me, you know, try and convince me to switch to get a degree in performance, but it wasn't possible for me because my scholarships were, you know, based on me being a music education okay. major. You know, I, I, I tried to kind of cobble together some experiences like taking classes that weren't on my, my, you know, recommended course courses for my degree, include like doing diction and doing undergrad opera and things like that, that weren't things that I had to do as a music ed major to try and make it possible for me to be more adept in performing. Um, I would say, honestly, like when it comes, when it came to composing and stuff, because I wasn't really sharing that music with anyone, that was a lot of self-motivation of like, you know, trying to convince yourself that there was even a point to keep writing things if no one was ever going to hear that. But I think that when I got older, I realized that there's a certain aspect to writing where the, you know, the process itself is just as important as what may happen once the piece is written. You know, like it's not about that. The, the, the purpose of the, of the process of composing is a way through which you can express something. And the finished product is there, regardless of if it gets performed or not, there's merit in the process. And that's something that's hard, I think, to learn when you're young. When you're young, it's like, oh, I wrote this thing. I really want people to hear it. And that's not necessarily always the point. Not And, you know, not every single thing that you write might be the best thing that needs to be out there in the world being performed. You know, you can you can learn a lot by just going through the process itself. That's beautiful. I mean, the idea that you don't have to just write something to get performed, but to learn from it and to, yeah, it's, I, lo I love that idea. And as I said before, something that I feel lucky in the choral world is that I'm surrounded by so many talented people. And uh, that's the reason why I have you here in the podcast, because I feel that you as a performer, as a choral artist, as I mentioned here in the podcast, you are an entrepreneur and you are, you put yourself out there. Even from your story, you say, you know, you were a music education major, but you could plan to take these other courses that allow you to have the career that you have today, which is very, very clever. And I love that idea of, okay, I, I can have some flexibility that allows me to go where I want to go or even to explore the things that I might like later. That will take us to now what you're doing today. What do you feel that it's your main title today? Do you, do you describe yourself as a performer who composes, a composer who performs, or is it more together um i mean i kind of i kind of like to say you know like you know when we have to like sit down and like come face to face with with what we what we do on a daily basis i think that happens when you have when someone's like oh i need a bio you know when you're like sending them a, a bio for a program and then it's like oh okay well how am i gonna like phrase this on there and like what do you you know what do you exactly. consider yourself to be you know it's that's a very complex question I mean, nowadays I'd say, you know, that I am a vocalist and composer because I kind of pair those things together. Uh -huh. But one of the things that I really like that's got me really excited about focusing more on composition is that I, you know, this is this is like a complex idea, but I'll, I'll explain it anyway, is that there's a there's this philosophy called um, like immortality through fulfillment of the ego which is the idea that even though we as human beings are, are mortal, you know, we're not going to be here forever is that if we create things that have a lasting impact, then in some aspect, we are, you know, our person lives on beyond the time that we have here. And that's something I find really exciting about composition is that like the first time I sold a piece of music and it went into a church library, as small as that is the thought that, 20 years from now or 20 years after I'm not no longer on this planet that someone could like find that piece of music in the library and decide to perform it means that part of me is still here. And I think that's something that doesn't get offered to you as a performer because performance itself is so ephemeral. It's, you know, it's here and it's gone. You know, every performance 
happens and it's, it's that one unique experience. And yes, there are some famous, you know, singers who have, you know, everyone knows Pavarotti, everyone knows Maria Callas, you know, those people are going to live on for many generations beyond us. But the likelihood that any one person is going to be that or achieve that kind of status is so small that part of me feels like there's more merit in just continuing to create things and put art out into the world through composition so that there's a voice that doesn't require me to physically be here, you know, to continue. So when I, when I think about like who I am now, I think it's kind of a balance between a vocalist and a composer, but I think as I get older, I think that might shift to be more composer. Cause also, you know, when your instrument is you, eventually you're going to get to a point where you can't perform anymore. We all know composers, you know, that are still, putting out music and are, you know, in an advanced age because as long as your mind still works and as long as you can hold a pencil, you can still create things. I mean, there's people like, you know, one of my favorite composers is George Crumb. George Crumb is still alive. He's still right. He, you know, he had a commission, I think as recently as like 2015 and he's in his eighties. Exactly. And as long as you can, you know, even speak, you know, even if you want to, dictate to somebody i don't know there are so many ways yeah exactly so i think i mean that's kind of a long complicated answer to the question but it's like that's how i feel like i feel like right now it's pretty balanced i feel like i do you know i, I perform a lot and i am writing a decent amount um but i think kind of as time goes on it'll probably you know go more and more and more towards composing and that's a beautiful answer because it really goes deeper into the many thoughts that you might have during choosing what you know what you say you are and it's okay to i mean you found the balance that you want to and the the way that you want to say what you are because then a lot of people might feel pressured by choosing one thing maybe society tells them you have to just choose one and go but as i said in the choral world i feel we do so many stuff and we excel at them so we can be this combination that's something that i like to talk about in the happy choir podcast because we can be this combination of maybe i conduct a little maybe i'm mainly a composer but i also sing yeah you know there are so many nuances of our personality as we are human so well i'd also say that you have to like all those things all those things inform the other aspects i mean if you're a composer and also c conduct a choir for instance you're going to be more sensitive to the kinds of things that may but you, you may need to include in scores for compo for our conductors. And if you're a singer, you're going to be more sensitive to maybe like the vocal line writing that you're, you know, or like the text underlay, you know, there are, there are things that all, they all inform each other. You know, you, you, in my opinion, you can't just be a composer in a vacuum. I mean, you can't just compose for some, you know, uh, like perfect ensemble in your head. You can, but your music's never going to sound like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it suddenly becomes being your customer, right? So yeah, exactly. You, even if, you know, you're in a restaurant and then you know that you're serving the food to yourself, you will think, huh, what do I like here? Or what wouldn't I like right. it to be here? And I think that also brings us to then our main topic today, that it's Inversion Ensemble, which is another side that I really enjoy of your career because you don't stop at being a singer and a composer, but also you can use this knowledge to create this great ensemble, to co-found this great ensemble. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so back in fall, the fall of 2016, um, our now artistic director, Trevor Shaw, who's also a composer and singer, he and I had a conversation while we were in the midst of doing a project for another ensemble that we were both singing with. Um, and previous to this, he had had a conversation with Adrian Ingles, who's also a composer and uh, instrumentalist. He had talked to her over the summer when they were when they were on a on a tour for an ensemble. So in the fall, we were talking about this. We were, you know, we had kind of a just general conversation about like Trevor saying that he, you know, he had written music. He was a published composer, and it was like, well, you know, my work's not getting performed, you know, and there's not as much of an impetus there to like continue like writing new pieces all the time when you, when, you know, there's not an avenue through which your stuff might ever get performed. You know, I said earlier, like, Oh, you know, the process can be 
rewarding. But, you know, if nothing is ever getting performed, then, you know, it's hard to have a motive, like our motivation to keep writing. So he said, you know, what do you think about starting an ensemble where, you know, we could like workshop new pieces. And he knew that I had written and, you know, he had heard my, heard a piece of mine for the chorus Austin. And, and he said, I know there's other composers in town who would, might be interested in that. And he's like, I've already talked to some singers and they're really excited about the idea of like getting to perform new music and actually work side by side with the composers. And so it was actually a pretty quick turnaround time because we had that discussion. Then we had a meeting with Adrian right after that. Then we started contacting singers and we're like, okay, well, we're just going to do like one concert. We're just going to see how this goes. You know, we're going to, let's pull some stuff together that we've already written, you know, try and come up with a, a theme for a concert. And we ended up having our first concert in February of 2017. So maybe like three months after our conversation. <laughs> so it was wow. a pretty fast turnaround time. You know, luckily when you sing, this is one of the things we were talking about before, like when you are a vocalist and you perform with other ensembles, you of course know an entire network of other singers. So being able to like reach out and be like, Hey, we're workshopping this idea. Do you want to be a part of it? So we were able to get together an ensemble and, you know, we had, we just would, we did one standalone concert in February of 2017 and, you know, it got enough attention, you know, including from people who, like people at KMFA and people from other ensembles about like this idea of like what we were doing. Cause it was different than from any other group in town. Since then we've just grown as an ensemble and we've done, you know, a ton of uh, concerts. We're now in the, we're now in the midst of our fourth season. Um, and we've done two emerging composer contests, which you're aware of since you won the first year. And we, have grown. I mean, we now have a 55 and up volunteer choir called Coda, a treble voice choir called Da Capo. Um, in, in addition to our, you know, our professional um, ensemble and all the groups have the same format. We perform music that's been written roughly in the last, you know, 15 to 20 years. And most of the music is being written by composers that are in the ensemble itself, writing for the actual project. So they get a theme, they understand the the parameters for it, they write things for it, you know. And it's really exciting because when these audience members come, you know, they're getting to hear like three quarters of the music on the concert are premieres. And they're getting to hear stuff for the first time. And it really kind of pushes the composers also to create, you know, within parameters and kind of write things. And sometimes it helps with focus on being able to know like exactly like what the subject matter is, you know, the instrumentation, the voicing, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's really, you know, it's really taken off and, you know, it's, it's been great. I mean, of course, the number of pieces I've had performed in the last two and a half years has been exponential compared to what was happening before inversion, because there's an avenue through which I can write things. And I've learned so much. And I would say that I'm a, I've developed a lot in the last couple of years as a composer, because I've learned things being in the room, you know, when my pieces are being workshopped and, and performed. You know, before I dig in into this section, I just want to talk about my experience with Inversion Ensemble because, as you said, we've worked together and me as a composer, this has been such a rewarding and learning process because of the humanity that the ensemble brings. It's not only that, you know, you're a composer, you're where the performers, let's do no. There's also this relationship that we create to bring to the audience. And I've always loved that about the ensemble. But also, I've been in the audience of many concerts of Inversion Ensemble. And it's so exciting to not know what's coming next, what's going to happen, and in which way uh, you're going to perform this piece or this premiere. What instrument are you going to bring to the to the texture of the, of the piece? And that's something that I feel as I hear you talk and I see it on the on stage. It's such a well-oiled machine of both performance, education, developing uh, new composers, and giving them a, a a place to to speak to the audience. But also, also you are bringing singers to perform these pieces and get to know maybe new notation or maybe new ways that they can use their voices. There's so much education going on here and. 
it just can grow, right? I mean, as you said, you started with, let's see what this one concert will do. And now you have three different ensembles that perform in a season. I mean, that's that's amazing. So congratulations on all of this. Yeah, it's been it's been very rewarding and also, you know, a tremendous amount of work. <laughs> so, you know, it, I mean, ultimately, you know, it's just really a handful of us doing all this kind of stuff behind the scenes. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think the most rewarding thing is kind of twofold. One is that having the having singers in the room with the composers and being able to know, like, that, you know, as a composer, there, there's a certain amount of trust that you have and kind of risk that you have when you finish a piece and you kind of hand it off to someone because you've created it and you kind of know what you think it should be in your mind. But ultimately when you're finished with the piece, the, the art making really isn't up to this performers, right? Like it's a collaboration. Every, every piece of every composition is a collaboration because you, unless it's a, a piece, you know, for a solo instrument and you compose it and you're also playing it, someone else is having to interpret your work. And so it's so great to like build those relationships and realize that you can trust people. It's, you know, through relationship building and these singers who like really believe in the importance of new music. And so they, you can trust them, you know, you know, like I'm putting my piece into good hands. People are going to be willing to take risks and, you know, play around with stuff and experience new things and like really make this piece come alive. And so like having building these relationships with these singers and con and the conductors and everything has been really rewarding. But the other side of it is, is what you were saying about being in the audience is that my favorite thing to happen is that is every time after a concert, someone tells me like, I've never been to a concert like this, or I didn't know that's what choral music could be. You know, we kind of want to just like shatter the expectations of what vocal music is, you know, and that's, that's such an important part for the audience to experience that. And then also people who've gone to choral concerts for years or even who are no new music to show them that there, that there can be a connection from the audience to the performers in things that are being written now that doesn't have to be so intellectual and so far removed and so avant-garde that they have like, they can't understand it. That's just confusing to them because we're, we don't want concerts that kind of insist upon themselves like that are just, new music for the sake of doing new music. That's why we have like these narrative concerts with themes and things like that, because when we want the audience to make a connection there to understand that there are people living today who are, are writing music that's relatable, that's important, that has a message. And you don't do that by alienating them by doing, you know, a two hour concert of, you know, nothing but like atonal aleatoric <laughs> music, Exactly. you know? So yeah, it's important to me. It's 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 building relationships both with the audience and internally with the ensemble itself. Hey, people. I want to take a quick second to tell you how your support makes a difference. When you support me on Patreon.com, you are not only giving $3 a month, but you are giving my brand a vote of confidence. This translates to helping several other artists to connect through choral music. Think about it as a cup of coffee that you invite me once a month. Only that is way more impactful and personal. Plus you get to be part of the behind the scenes of my career as a composer, with the many perks that I shared in there. Even if you're not able to give right now, your support listening to this podcast is great, even more if you leave a review in iTunes. Patreon.com slash Composer Cordero is the link that you want to visit or share with others. Hope to see you there. Well, and it's such a dream come true to hear now, you know, the reaction of the audience, as you say, but also to have this ensemble that, as you say, brings this to the table and says, okay, this is a statement and we stand behind it because maybe we, th uh, we think of new music as a tunnel, two hours, go. And it's not. It's so different from that experience. So I think that somehow this... Um, This is a very timely ensemble that you've created here. So I wanted to know in these first three months after you had 
this meeting with Adrian and Trevor, uh, which, hello, by the way, you're awesome. And I hope, you know, if you're listening to have you here in the podcast. <laughs> uh, in these three months before the first concert, were there a lot of challenges? Was it exciting or frightening? What was going through your mind? I mean, I think it's kind of a mix of all, all of that. I mean, luckily, Trevor had experience from when he lived up in Dallas of like working with, you know, working with groups and, you know, directing ensembles and, um, you know, doing that. So he, he brought that to the table and, um, you know, I, I consider myself to be pretty detail oriented and, and organized and that kind of stuff. So it was like, we kind of figured out like who should do what, I mean, that was kind of the first step, like, okay, who's going to do what Trevor's going to direct the group. <laughs> and, you know, I'm going to take care of administrative stuff and Adrian's going to help with that. We'll kind of figure out who's going to do what tasks. And, you know, Trevor had already kind of worked up a, a working list of people he had spoken to. And it's like, you know, let's make, try and get a balanced, balanced ensemble. And then, and he already knew of composers who were in the area who would benefit from being part of this group. So, I mean, it was a pretty fast turn, turnaround time and it took a lot of really quick organizing. And, you know, we of course weren't sure exactly how, how to go about this. Like different ensembles have different formats when it comes to rehearsing and that kind of stuff. And we, we kind of merged two models together of how to, rehearse because we knew with so many singers being in so many different ensembles that having like a weekly commitment was something that was just not possible. We would get far less singers if we were asking people to be there like, you know, every Thursday night for six weeks. So we ended up going with a model where we'd have these read through sessions where we would just kind of read through everything. And then we, we did that like three or four times for the first concert. And then we actually had just had concert week where we had like more concentrated time. Um, you know, so working that out, working out schedules, getting singers, getting a accompanist. You know, we had a guest conductor on the very first concert, finding a venue. You know, those are all things that happen. You kind of just figure it out as you go. And luckily, because, you know, many of us had been part of the choral world in Austin for so long, making those connections were easier to find. But, you know, you still have to go through the process of doing that. And of course, over time, you learn more and more and more, and those things become easier because you now have experience doing them. I think the ensemble now has, you know, is performing at a different level, but we, you know, you can't just start there. So I think that's an important thing for people to understand. Like if they're listening to this podcast and they're thinking about starting their own ensemble, you know, even if you get the best singers in your city, it may be the first time that those people are all performing together and performing new music has its own individual yeah. challenges and singers have to also get you get comfortable and used to working with composers and like, especially some composers who are more experienced than others and other people who may, you may have to ask questions about markings or, you know, things like that in their score. And so, you know, it's definitely a learning experience, but just know that, even if you have a first concert and it's not the greatest concert you've ever done in your life, like it's, it's okay. You need to, it's a place to start and you can build on that and you just want to get better every time. You know, you're always scared and you're always hesitant to do that first step, but that doesn't mean that that defines the whole thing that you do. And it's exciting to see how you were just on, on it because, you know, you had a deadline that was this concert, that first concert that you want to give. And you just have to know who was doing what and fix or find this next thing, right? Yeah, I think that's the, I think that's important, you know, to, to figure out. I mean, I think that people, when it comes to administrative stuff, which, you know, it's not the most glamorous thing in the world to talk about, but it's important to the functioning, you know, the functionality of an ensemble is that it's just as important for people who are wanting to do behind the scenes things for a for an organization to recognize the things that they, yes, it's important to be like, Oh, I'd really like to do X, Y, and Z, or I'm really good at X, Y, and Z. But you also really need to know the stuff that you are not good at or the things that you don't want to do. Because oftentimes people will volunteer to do things because like some, someone has to do it, but they may either like not have the skill set to do it, not enjoy doing it, 
you know, it may be stressful to them. You know, if there's someone saying that they like absolutely don't want to be, you know, in charge of the website or social media or whatever, and then that kind of gets forced upon them, then, you know, the quality of that is going to suffer. And you want someone who's doing that. I mean, early in the conversation, as Trevor essentially said to me and Adrian, like, I don't want to be in charge of the administrative side. I hate doing it. It stresses me out. I don't want to be in charge of like telling people when to be places and where to be. And, you know, he doesn't like doing that. He wants to focus on the artistic side of things. So it's like, great. I have no problem doing that. You know, I have no problem contracting the singers. And, you know, Adrian had no problem like securing venues for us and hiring instrumentalists and that kind of stuff. So it's important that you have those open, honest, candid conversations about what people do well and what things that they openly recognize that they don't do well or don't want to do. Because you have to also be willing to ask for help because there are many people in your ensemble, in your community, even if they're not performing, that are friends of yours or like, you know, come to a concert and really enjoy it. And, you know, to ask them like, Hey, we really need someone to, you know, help like run our ticket table or that, or like be an usher or help set up and tear down after concerts. Like those things are important because that final product that gets presented to the audience, you know, that doesn't just magically happen. And we are so blessed that we have had singers who also, I mean, I, I can't remember a time that we didn't have a concert where singers were there early to help set up, like without even, I mean, without even asking, like, I know that people are going to show up. It's like, I just have to say like, Hey, you know, we're, we need some help moving some stuff before the concert. And we'll have like 12 people there and it'll take, you know, 15 minutes to move everything because there's so many people or we need to put everything back the way it was in this church that we're renting. Don't take those things for granted, but it's also worth having an open conversation about what people are willing to do. Because even if someone can only give, you know, an hour of their time once a month, that is one less thing that you are taking on yourself. And that's the other lesson I would say, don't try and do everything yourself. <laughs> yeah, you will quickly burn out, right? You will burn out. And I, I mean, we were guilty of that early on. I'm very much a person who doesn't like to delegate because I want to make sure things are done correctly. And that's about building trust with people. And sometimes you have to just take risks and ask people to do things and then You know, if it works out and they did it well, then, you know, you can trust them to do things later on. You know, it's okay to do things incrementally. It's okay to build your organization over time. I mean, when we tell people what we've done in, you know, now close to three years, I, you know, people are, are blown away by the growth and, and advancement of the, of the organization. But I also know of other organizations similar to ours in other parts of the country who, you know, right out of the box, like right out of the... At, at the very beginning of the ensemble, like they're already a nonprofit. They already have like funding through the city. They, it's, these are things that they have early on, but they spent like a year and a half doing administrative stuff before they ever even had a concert. So it really depends on what your focus is. There's no correct way to do it. You can get to the same goal, you know, through a lot of paths. Well, that's wonderful. And something that I see in the story that you're telling me too, is that you built a organization. I can see it on stage that, It's based on trust. So that's why people love to help other than just sing because they're not just singer or just composers. Even after the concerts, you can see that people are staying to help. You can see that the the barrier between audience and singers and performers, it's broken because then we're talking, we're hugging, we are... I feel it's a community. In version Ensemble, I feel it's a community that, as you said, honesty is something that it's upfront and it's wonderful to be part of that experience that you bring to not only the concert but also for example for me when I attend to a rehearsal even in emails I mean all of the the way that the organization is run it's wonderful I think the, those things happen organically it has to do with who you include in the ensemble and casting a wide net and making sure the group is also you know diverse and from lots of different backgrounds and things like that because it builds It builds a camaraderie, but that has to happen naturally. Yeah. And the the fact that you know that you have somebody there who cares, it's, it's already a win. I just want to quickly remind you that all of the links that are mentioned in this episode will be in the show notes in the happychoir.com slash podcast or find it in the description of this episode. Also, 
once you are there in the website, you can subscribe to the newsletter. This will come with a $20 discount for your next Coral recording, a free guide that I've created just for you on the things that I've discovered in my career on how to be a happy composer, conductor, or singer. You will also receive a weekly email with podcast episodes, blog posts, and music. I hope to see you there. Now, let's get back to this episode. For the last part of this interview, there is a recording question that I do to my guests. What's one thing you wish composers will know or do? For composers, if you're writing choral music, even if you're not a singer, I would, something that I do because I'm because I was a singer first is that I kind of obsessively sing through all of the parts of my piece. So if I'm writing an eight part piece, I'm going to sing through every, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to spend, I'm going to go through the entire piece a couple of times singing like the soprano one part and the soprano two part and then alto one and I'm going through every single part so that you can understand whether or not something is, uh, I wouldn't even say singable, but whether or not something is, is comfortable. Um, it's very, sometimes it's very difficult to like step back and you, you look at your piece from, from a, a larger perspective and it's, and you lose sight of what's happening and that there's going to be individual people performing individual parts. And so you may not realize that some transition is really difficult for like three of the eight parts because it's some like, you know, really difficult interval or the tuning is going to be really difficult. The tessitura, you know, is hard on, you know, on certain voice parts, those kinds of things. So I would just say if you're writing choral or vocal music, even if you're not a singer, sing through every single part. It's okay if things are hard. I'm not saying you should simplify music, but if you can find a more finesse way to do something, you're going to be happier with the end product because it's going to, it's going to be easier for the singers to then perform it. And it's going to be closer to what you envisioned for your final product. If you, And I do you know it. I do that myself, and it's normal that for some, for example, when we then zoom in into the part, then we are like, oh, even sometimes I find my, myself bored in my part. And like, yeah. hmm. <laughs> right. I would also I would also say if you are writing for you know mixed voices or even just treble choir, you can make a lot of friends by writing interesting alto parts because oftentimes they're really boring just the eoe flat or really difficult because you're filling in all the chord the chord tones or whatever <laughs> or you need you're like oh that's right i'm going to add like a seven or a nine or whatever to this chord i'll just put it in the altos and then it ends up being either really boring or very difficult i kind of mean this as a joke but not really like hey it's it's also okay to give your altos the melody do you have a uh, something that you wish that uh, singers would know or do i think for singers just in general i think just be willing to take risks, be willing to like really go there, really sing what's on a page. You know, if a composer is taking the time to write out a bunch of markings and a bunch of dynamics and, you know, like instructions and things like just really go there, go way beyond your comfort zone, be willing to, you know, feel, feel ridiculous doing things, especially with new music, because Oftentimes, composers are trying to paint with a new palette. We're trying to explore new sounds. And if you limit yourself to the tools that you have from singing kind of standardized vocal music, you're not, it's not as rewarding to you as a singer, because it's not just about creating the thing for the composer or for the audience, but it's rewarding as a singer. You know, like be willing to make sounds that you, you don't consider quote unquote pretty. Be willing to recognize that there are sounds and things that you can do that are not conventionally acceptable that are okay. If a composer is asking for something very specific and you're like, like, oh, well, you know, that doesn't align with what I've been taught about choral singing, that's okay. We oftentimes, I think, re wholesale reject things um, because they're new and different. And that's a very human thing to do. But it's so rewarding when you let yourself just do something way out of the box and be like, wow, I can really make that sound. Also, like, look up. I don't like the term extended techniques because if we can if we can do it with our voice, it's not extended. It's just a technique. I love that. Look up those things. Watch videos of people doing overtone singing or aggressive singing or, you know, uh, 
other, you know, other sounds and things and just explore what your voice can do. Your human voice is such an incredibly versatile instrument. It's the most versatile instrument that exists. So why limit it to singing nothing but bel canto legato music? That's beautiful. It's great, but it's extremely boring if that's all you're going to do with it. It's like owning a super expensive uh, violin and like only ever playing Bach. That's great, but there's so much more out there to explore. So I think just be willing to take risks, be willing to be ridiculous and absurd and embarrass yourself. It, it, there are rewards there for doing that. Well, I have two thoughts about this that you just said, because one, it's like, you know, if the, that thing that they say that we only use a 10% of our brain, that's could be the same thing of not, don't use just the 10% of your voice. Your voice is so amazing and it's so unique too, right? So we all have this different instrument kind of unique to us. Number one, you will expand your tools. And then when you're asked in the future to do something, you will say, yes, I've tried that. You know, you, you will have even more. Yeah, exa exactly. If you want a career, if you want to be competitive, like if you're a singer primarily, and that's what you want to do full time and you're wanting to be a performer, being able and willing to be like, yeah, I, I'm comfortable singing like new compositions, you know, with, with, you know, d techniques that are not normal from Western ideology of, of vocal singing that makes you more competitive. That makes you more hireable. That, give, that gets you jobs that other people aren't willing or aren't, you know, don't have the experience to do. That makes you more competitive. Like, why wouldn't you do that? There's a million people out there singing Bel Canto, but not everyone's going to have done, done those kinds of things. So, yeah. And I, just to clarify the thing that I said about extended techniques, the reason why I don't like that is not just saying like, it is a technique that you can do with your voice. So it's not quote unquote extended, But also there's a subtle implication there that if it's not something that's except it's, if it's not something that's standard in Western music, it's quote unquote extended. And to me that d downplays and kind of um, doesn't give credit to vocal techniques from other parts of the world. Music is not a Western invention. So we need to like reject the idea that like overtone singing or throat singing or something like that is a quote unquote extended technique. It's not. It's a technique, because to someone who is grows up with throat singing, bel canto is an extended technique. So it's about context. So that's why I just wanted to clarify what I meant by that earlier. For the last part, do you have anything that you wish conductors would know or do? I think conductors in general, when it comes to new works, um, especially if you have access to the composer. I mean, even if they're not in the room, if you've if you've commissioned a piece or you're performing a piece and you can contact them, I think one, let people know you're performing their music. You know, oftentimes, even if they're a published composer, you know, they may not find out until months later that a piece of theirs was bought. You know, so they're like, oh, someone bought this. But also people buy things and don't perform them. They buy them for their library. They buy them to read They may not perform them, but if you are intending to perform something like send them an email, most composers have a website or they're on social media and you can reach out and, you know, because it, it's exciting to know that your stuff is being performed. But then the next step is also be willing to make yourself vulnerable as a, as a conductor and ask questions of the composer. Like, mm -hmm. what did you mean by this? Like, or I'm, this is what I'm thinking, you know? Because oftentimes composers will be completely deferential and be like, yeah, that's fine. I mean, whatever works for your ensemble. Like if they're like, oh, I need to take this slower because this is a tough passage. And if we do it at tempo, you know, whatever. A lot of composers are going to be like, great, you know, you do what you need to do. But there may be something where the composer, where you have a teaching moment between you and the composer in both directions. The conductor may be like, hey, I saw this, but we're doing it this way. And then the con composer may learn something from that as well. I think also this is this is a pet peeve I think a little bit of of um, for conductors when they're interpreting new music is that I think that we as a music community not just in core music but in general we put composers like you know big you know Beethoven and Bach and Mozart and whatever we put them up on such a high pedestal that we're like so insistent con conductors are so incredibly insistent that we follow exactly things that were written in the score the exact articulation, the exact dynamics, the exact tempo markings. 
And then you hand them a score by someone who wrote something two years ago. And they're like, oh, well, I'm going to, I like this tempo better. I know it says staccato, but we're going to actually sing that legato or whatever. And it's like, would you do that to a, a Bach chorale? No, because we put that person on a pedestal. So we either need to be willing to interpret music by these big names the same way we treat modern music, or we need to apply the same standard to modern music and try and do what's on the page first and then make adaptations if you need to. So one thing that I would say, if you're a conductor and you're listening to this, try it the way that it's written. Try and understand why the composer was doing it. And if it all fails and you don't know why and you have the ability to contact them, ask them because they may have an answer of what they were trying to accomplish. That doesn't mean you have to stick with that, but you at least, I think, owe a little bit of deference to the person who wrote it. Otherwise, you're just taking a piece of music and you're you're composing, you're not performing that work, you're composing a new piece of music based on their notes on a page. Exactly, and we're alive, so that's... Right. <laughs> I'm alive, I have an email address, please email exactly. me. <laughs> so, Robbie, any announcements for us that you want to share with our audience? I know you have a concert coming up. Yeah, we have um, Inversion has our next concert um, February 29th and March 1st. Um, this is a concert called Ether Fire. This whole season has been, we have four concerts and each, each concert has been focused on one of the kind of ancient alchemical elements of earth, air, fire, and water. Um, the fire concert is a kind of interpretation of literal, like the literal fire element, but also a focus on like the psyche and mental health as well. We're partnering with National Alliance for Mental Illness Central Texas, which is a great charity here in Austin that provides advocacy and um, resources for people dealing with um, mental health issues. Um, it's going to be a really great concert. You can go to inversionensemble.com for information about locations and also to purchase tickets. Um, and we, we're running a special right now on, on ticket prices as well. So if you do it soon, you can get uh, discount on tickets. Wonderful. And any place that they can find you online? Um, you can go to RobbieLabenka.com for my composer website, um, all of my relevant social media. I'm at, at RJ Labenka on Instagram and then Facebook.com backslash my first and last name together as well. And also check out Inversion Ensemble at social media as well at, at Inversion Ensemble on Instagram and Facebook.com backslash Inversion Ensemble. And of course, all of this will be in the show notes and you can find all of the links to Robbie's social media and composition website and inversion ensemble there in my website. But I just want to say that, Robbie, that thank you so much for such an inspiring conversation and such an honest sharing of your story and the way that we can also work as a choral artist. So thank you so much for being the show today. Of course. Thanks so much for having me, Carlos. See you in the next episode of the Happy Choir Podcast. Ciao, people. You've been listening to the Happy Choir podcast. For more information and show notes, visit thehappychoir.com. Hum.